Well, as we, as we come from a time of worship, I trust God has opened your heart and uh, we're going to open God's word. And would you join me as we pray together? Lord, we worship you. We thank you for who you are. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for these messages to the churches that we get to study and we get to see the heart of Jesus towards churches. And Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts. Lord, we, we continue to see it over and over again. He who is that person who has ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says. And Lord, we just open our hearts and pray that you would open our ears to hear what you want to say to us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm in Revelation chapter 2. I want to read verses 18 and then go right into chapter 3 and end in chapter 3, verse 6. To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of their ways. I will strike her children Dead. Wow. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches the hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teachings and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. To the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my Father. I will also give that one the morning star. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Chapter 3, to the angel of the church in Sardis, write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white." I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life, but will acknowledge that name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Well, today as we look at a further two of the seven churches to whom the book of Revelation was written, we can't miss seeing that Jesus has a message for each individual church. And it's the only recorded message that we actually have from Jesus to a local church. As we noted a few weeks ago, Jesus is standing in the midst of these seven churches. He's not standing aloof, talking at them. He's not standing above them, pronouncing judgment. He's actually in their midst. He knows them intimately. He's, with, he, he's, he's come alongside of them in their challenges and in their suffering. His words of commendation. Uh, they are in a particularly challenging season, and I won't recount the historical context, only to say that the churches to whom this letter is addressed, they were living in a time when persecution was not only among them, but was actually ramping up. Emperor worship had been mandated. The de declaration that Caesar is Lord was the order of the day. And that, of course, was problematic for followers of Jesus. Their refusal to worship temples dedicated to Caesar and their declaration that Jesus is Lord made them targets. They were labeled as disloyal, as divisive. They were seen as disturbers within the culture. Their allegiance to Jesus was seen as political, and it put them on the wrong side of the power brokers and the gatekeepers of the culture. Not only were Christians being expelled from places of influence, some of them were losing their livelihood and some were losing their lives. And Jesus has a message to the churches that he delivers them through this revelation. 
And we've noted that the word translated revelation means the unveiling, the pulling back of the curtains. To these churches going through opposition, to these churches that were suffering persecution, this book opens things up. And they not only see the glorified Jesus, but they actually get a glimpse into the unseen realm. They're able to see what the evil one is doing, but especially they're able to see the final outcome of history. As we look at Jesus' message to these individual churches, we note that while it's the, me the message is to them, this message is actually for us. And you heard it, this oft-repeated call of whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That prompts me to look at Jesus' words and ask the question, Jesus, what are you saying to me? What are you saying to us through these messages? To these churches that were going through significant challenge, Jesus offers great commendation. And as well, Jesus speaks some words of correction. Why? Because their health and their vitality are important. And when an individual or a church is on an unhealthy path, or maybe even a, you know, a deadly course, Jesus does the most loving thing. He warns and he points out dangers and he calls for course correction. Last week, when we looked at Jesus' message to the church in Pergamum, Jesus warns them about losing their way through compromising with the beliefs and the mindset of a culture that had embraced and promoted values that really ran completely counter to Jesus' way. In a culture where evil was prevalent and even celebrated, Jesus calls the believers in Pergamum to be faithful witnesses of Jesus. Well, as we work our way through Jesus' message to the seven churches, we get a clear picture of what Jesus has in mind for the church, actually for our church. And so today as we look at the church in Thyatira and the church in Sardis, we're going to see that Thyatira was a great church, but was actually in danger of being led astray. Sardis was a church that had experienced great days, but they were actually in danger because they thought they were still great, but they actually weren't. So I want us to dive in. In the opening verses, we see Jesus introducing himself as the son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. That was actually significant because the city of Thyatira hosted a major cult of the pagan god Apollo. In Greek mythology, Apollo was the son of Zeus, who was the ruler or the king of the gods. Apollo then, as the son, was referred to as the son of God. And Jesus reminds them that he's actually the true son of God. Not in the way that Greek deities spawn sons and daughters, but as the eternal pre-existent second person of the Trinity. And he comes with eyes that are like blazing fire. His gaze penetrates. He sees into the darkened corners of the human heart. His feet are burnished bronze. Bronze, of course, speaks of permanence. He's not going to crumble like the pagan statues that were made of clay. He was not going to crumble like the rulers who came and went. And Jesus begins with words of commendation. He says this, I know your deeds. Now, this was a church that was actually producing good things. There was fruitfulness. They were making a difference. And Jesus says, I know your love and faith. I know your service and your perseverance. That's interesting to me that not only was Jesus seeing their deeds, he was taking note of their service. That word service indicates that their good deeds actually came out of a servant's heart. They served the poor because of the love, their, their love for Jesus. They served in places where there was little recognition, where there was probably no acclaim and very little reward. You know, somebody has pointed out that a true servant keeps on serving even when they are treated like a servant. And that's what marked the church in Thyatira. Jesus notes that they persevered. They would not be dissuaded from serving even in the midst of hardship and in the midst of discouragement. And remarkably, Jesus points out that they were actually doing more now than they had done at first. And I say that that's remarkable because, you know, human nature is that we often start out strong, but then we pull, we pull back and maybe we even pull out of, of, of serving. I mean, they didn't do that. As time went on, 
they, they intensified their good works. Their fervor was ramped up as time went on. They refused to grow weary in, in their well-doing. There was a passion and a level of commitment that grew over time. Nobody was saying, you know, I've done my time, I've served God, you know, let others step in to serve. The church in Thyatira was active, it was vibrant. So then you come to verse 20 and Jesus' strong words actually seem somewhat harsh and, and, and jarring. He says this, nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. And then he goes on to describe her this way. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. So the question, of course, is who is Jezebel and what was she teaching? Well, we know Jezebel from the Old Testament. Her name is synonymous with evil influence. The story is this, that her father was the king of the Phoenician Empire and King Ahab, one of the kings of Israel, marries her. God had forbidden his people to intermarry with the enemies of Israel, but the king, King Ahab, ignores God's law and he marries Jezebel in part to make peace with her father and thereby to secure greater job security for himself. Jezebel brings her gods and her religion and at one point, she orders all of the prophets of God to be put to death, and she hires 450 prophets of Baal, the God that they served. She hires them to serve in Israel. Through Jezebel's manipulation and really her seduction, God's people are led further and further away from God and deeper and deeper into, into destruction. In the end, both Jezebel and Ahab are destroyed but she leaves the legacy of one whose name represents sexual promiscuity and control over, over uh, God's people, and particularly over Ahab. So who was, who was this Jezebel in Thyatira? Well, I'd have to believe that the church in Thyatira knew exactly who John was referring to and who Jesus was referring to. The original language actually calls her a Jezebel of a woman. That means she, she, had, she had profile, she had influence in the church, she called herself a prophet, she gained a hearing, she had some credibility as a teacher in the church. So what was going on in Thyatira that enabled Jezebel's teaching to gain the kind of traction that it did? We know a little bit about the city of Thyatira. It was located on an intersection of two major routes. That made the city a great commercial town. It's been described as a blue-collar town. It was known for the many trade guilds. I referenced this last week when we looked at Pergamum, that if you were a craftsperson, if you produced goods, you were part of a trade guild. That's how it worked. When archaeologists dug through the ruins of Thyatira, they uncovered a number of inscriptions of these guilds. They, they, they uncovered the Leathermakers Guild and the Blacksmiths and the Coppersmiths. But the two most important guilds actually related to fabrics, that's wools and linens. And you might remember that when Paul comes to Philippi, he encounters a woman by the name of Lydia, who is a dealer in purple cloth from Thyatira. Every craftsperson was compelled to be part of one of these guilds. These guilds would protect, they would advance the interests of the trades, but the guilds were also connected to one of the many gods that were worshipped. On a regular basis, the members of that guild would come together for a time of feasting, a time of partying. The cult that was dedicated to Apollo was so big in Thyatira because Apollo was actually recognized as the god of arts and crafts. And so the guilds would often hold their parties at the temple to Apollo. They would offer meat, they would pour out wine to the gods as a way to appease these gods, as a way to attract the favor of the gods. The other part of, of, of the worship of Apollo is that the partying involved cultic prostitutes who would service the guilds. Of course, the legend of Apollos includes many male and female lovers. Apollo sired many children with uh, mortal females and nymphs and goddesses. So sexual immorality was deeply embedded in this myth about Apollos. If you were part of the guild, you were expected to participate in these celebrations. 
If you refused, it, it, it would mean you would face expulsion, and that would mean that you would lose your livelihood. And so for a tradesman, you, you just went along with all of this so that you could maintain your standing in the community and you could prosper in your trade. As you can well imagine, this became a problem for the tradesmen who were followers of Jesus. And what arose in the church in Thyatira was this teaching that said this, you can live in both worlds. You can participate in guild parties and still be a faithful follower of Jesus. This Jezebel of a woman was teaching that it was acceptable to compromise with the ways of the world. It was this idea that it was okay to go along with the requirement of the guild in order to make a living and that God would understand, that God would overlook this. It's the idea that if my business practices and my livelihood collide with godly principles, then compromise is justified. And Jesus' reaction to this idea could not be stronger. He had warned Jezebel to cease and desist. He had given her time to repent, but she was unwilling. And Jesus is saying, listen, her time is coming to an end. And, and she's just not going to be able to do her damage anymore. What Jesus identifies as sin is a serious matter. To compromise with sin has serious consequences. You know, over my lifetime, I have watched the pendulum swing. Uh, growing up in a very strong Christian home, there was a, there was a very long list of don'ts for Christians. <laughs> You know, looking back, I can see that our church culture, the church culture I grew up in, called things sin that had little or no biblical basis. And the unintended consequence of legalism is, of course, this reaction of a wholesale, re wholesale rejection of truth about sin. That's, so the pendulum swings the other way. But listen, friends, there are boundaries. There are things that God calls sin. There are some thou shalt nots that are established by God for our own good. We live in a time when the culture calls evil good and good evil. And Jesus has a strong warning about that. Now, not all of the believers in Thyatira had fallen for the deception of Jezebel. In verse 26, Jesus says this to Christians who did not tolerate the teachings of Jezebel. He said, to the one who is victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. To people who were being compelled to choose between wholehearted devotion to Jesus and compromising with the culture, Jesus makes the promise that if you refuse to cave to the pressure to conform to the world for the sake of your position and your standing and your job, I, Jesus, will give you position and standing and authority in realms that you've never dreamed of. I will give you authority over nations. Here's the point. Remain faithful to God in this moment, even if you're going through pressure, and you can be confident that God will make up for any loss that you incur because of your faithfulness. And he's going to make it up many times over. Listen, this life, this moment, this difficult circumstance is not all, this, all there is. It's certainly not how the story ends. And there may be some of you who find yourself in situations, maybe in your workplace, maybe in a relationship, maybe in some sphere of life where you are being pressured to compromise what you know violates the will and the purpose of God. And Jesus is saying, reject the lie that compromise with sin is a good way forward. Stand firm in the truth. Well, what about the church in Sardis? What's Jesus' message to them? You know, Jesus has almost no commendation except that there were a few people who had not been contaminated. Jesus identifies himself as the one who holds the seven spirits and the seven stars. Though Jesus sees little good in the church in Sardis, his words come as one who holds the church in Sardis, and he's holding the leaders of that church. He says, I'm holding you in my hands. Now, his evaluation and his rebuke, they're harsh, but they're not punitive. He's saying, listen, there's a crash coming, and I want to wake you up before you suffer the damage that, could, that is going to befall you. I mean, they had a reputation that they were alive, but it wasn't based on reality. It, of course, it would seem that at one point, they were spiritually alive. You know, reputations are earned, and they had earned this good reputation. But Jesus' assessment is that they were actually dead. They had the appearance of vitality. In other words, on the outside, there were some really good things that were happening. But like a tree that looks fine on the outside, but is rotting on the inside, Sardis was in danger. 
and they didn't know it or they were simply ignoring it. So what was really going on? Again, context is significant. As a city, Sardis actually had a great and glorious past. There was a river that flowed through the city that was rich in gold. The wealth of that city allowed them to build this great fortified city that was actually on top of a mountain, 1,500 feet above the valley. And they built the city in such a way that it appeared to be absolutely secure from the attacks of the enemy. On one side, they built these very high, smooth walls, and on the other side were some natural steep cliffs. Because of the gold, the city became incredibly wealthy, and because of its location, the city felt very, very secure. When Sardis went to war with the neighboring king, the armies of Sardis, had to, they were driven back and they had to retreat into the security of their, their city, this fortress. What happened was the enemy army waited in the valley. The walls, of course, were unscalable. The cliffs were impossible to climb. So the enemy waited. And after a couple of weeks of waiting and watching, there was a soldier in the valley who observed that a soldier up on the wall in the fortress city dropped something. I believe it was a helmet or something. They dropped it over the edge. And they watched as this soldier, this person, made their way down and there was a crevice in the stone and they retrieved what had been dropped. That night, a party of soldiers found that crevice. They were able to scale the cliffs and they got into the city. And when they got to the top, they found the city completely unguarded and they were able to capture that city. History repeated itself 200 years later, exactly the same thing happened. By the time John was writing this letter, the city on the hill was partially destroyed. It was uninhabitable. The city of Sardis was now in the valley below, but the ruins on top of that mountain, they were that constant reminder of past wealth and past power and past glory. That abandoned fortress stood as a memorial to the overconfidence and the lack of vigilance that had allowed the enemy to come in and destroy the city. And friends, that is so true of us as individual Christians and also true of churches. The church in Sardis had seen incredible days. They, they still had the reputation that they were alive, but they had stopped being vigilant. Somewhere along the line, they had let down their guard. Somewhere in their past, they had become careless about protecting the life that they had been given. And friends, it's how we as individuals, it's also how churches lose their vitality and how we die spiritually. You know, it's not that difficult to have an appearance of spiritual vitality. You know, we, we can put on a show of spiritual life and vitality, but the show is often a cover for the breach that allows the enemy to come in. And it's so easy to get comfortable and complacent. It's easy to, easy to forsake vigilance so that the enemy will gain a foothold, and with the walls breached and our defenses down, the enemy can do incredible damage. And Jesus' words to this church are, wake up. Strengthen what remains, shore up the cracks, pr quit pretending that all is well when it clearly isn't. In chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus instructs them. He says, remember what you have received and heard. Don't just remember the days when you were alive and vibrant in your relationship with Jesus. Do, to do two things. Number one, hold it fast. That is, take proactive steps to return back to that place of vibrant faith in Jesus. And then number two, repent, turn around. This is a wake-up call turn around. The message to us from Sardis is this, quit fooling yourself and quit fooling around. Recognize where you are vulnerable. Recognize where you've let your guard down. Don't continue to ignore your spiritual health and its vitality. And here's Jesus's promise to those who heed his warning. It's in verse 5. He says, I will acknowledge their name before my Father and his angels. In other words, Jesus' desire for you, for me, is that he can present you to the Father as one of his own. And that happens as we are vigilant, as we don't let the enemy in, as we, as we take care of our spiritual life and vitality. And he's able then to present you, to present me to the Father and say, they belong to us. Would you pray with me? Lord, thank you that we do belong to you. And Lord, we take this warning seriously that to a city that was not vigilant and 
history over and over on a, at least a couple of occasions repeated itself that the enemy was able to come in and, and bring great destruction. Lord, we understand how vulnerable we can be if we're not vigilant. We know how the enemy wants to come in and gain a foothold and just find a little place, a little crevice to find his way into our lives. Lord, help us to, to guard our hearts, to do the kinds of things, to repent, to turn around when we've gone down a path that is not good, to come back to you, to not only remember the good days, but to take hold of the very things that were needed in order to have that kind of life, spiritual life and vitality. Lord, I pray today for every person who's heard me, whoever, every person who's hung in there as we've looked at these churches. Lord, would you help us to go into our week and to, and to walk with the kind of vigilance that you, in, that you call us to. And Lord, for those who maybe are just exploring this, maybe this is all new, wondering what faith in Jesus is, is about, I pray that, that you would open their hearts wide to receive your grace and your message of the good news of the gospel. I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. And listen, if you would like to just touch base with one of our pastors, it's as easy as going to our website, hitting the Start Here button. There's a Connect card there. There's, it's a way to connect with us. There's also some other resources there that we would commend to you. There's also going to come up on the screen some, some reflection questions, and I commend those to you. God bless you. Thanks for being with us today.